Welcome to the Naked Truth Podcast, where we interview mental health practitioners, medical providers, life coaches, ghost hunters, and nudists. Not nudists yet. And that'll be on our upcoming After Dark on Patreon, which we will announce more about later. Stay tuned. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but today we're interviewing Avery Sunshine, a life coach. And she actually, she is literally sunshine. She walked in with amazing bright orange hair, beautiful gold jewelry on, just a personality, like walking sunshine, honestly. And now that you bring it up, Sophie, I forgot to ask Avery about her jewelry because she did have that sun yes. and she had all kinds of other jewelry, which was which was very cool to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just, just shining, shining bright. Shining bright. <laughs> and her actually motto for her business is choose to shine. Choose to shine. And that's... Sign, shine, mindset. She specializes... In helping people with selective mutism, social anxiety, public speaking, self confidence. She has lots of audiobooks that she recommends, which I will link in the episode notes. Um, she has an upcoming training for teens, which we'll also include information about. I loved that we discussed difference between life coaches who have done training and are certified to do it versus therapists, social workers, and other professionals. Versus therapists and social workers, et cetera, but also versus just people who call themselves life coaches. She actually did extensive work and research and practice and in her own life training. Yes. So we love to make that differentiation because we do think it's important to have some kind of, you know, regulation. And she is, she's really good at what she does. And with all that being said... Let's interview Avery. Yay! Let's do it. Welcome, Avery Sunshine. And if you guys can imagine, she's this beautiful redhead with these awesome glasses. She looks the coolest and she matches everything and she's just full of sunshine. That's all. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Avery, tell us a little bit about your business and uh, the name and everything. Yes, everything. So I sort of fell into my business. Um, it's called Sunshine Mindset. And how I fell into it was I had two daughters who overcome selective mutism and social anxiety. And once I got them through it, I'm like, okay, it's my turn to do the work. So I really took a deep dive into, you know, self-growth, self-transformation. Are you saying that you had to overcome selective mutism or anxiety yourself? You said that your daughters had to overcome Yes, that. I but also then you did. Said, <gasps> Okay. Yes. Wow. <laughs> also, what is that? I'm unfamiliar. Um, so selective mutism is an extreme form of shyness, and it's where the fear of verbal communication, sometimes even nonverbal communication, is so big that in specific settings or places, they just are not able to communicate. Like your body just shuts down. So they might look frozen or blank face or emotionless. Um, it's just that the fear is way too intense and too big for them at the moment. Okay. So you fell into your business because you were helping your daughters overcome selective mutism and anxiety. Social anxiety. Social anxiety. And then you, once you help them, then you figured out it's my turn to yes. Be to beat this. Yes. Okay. Um, a fire was burning inside of me when I noticed that they were struggling and I really was a maniac on a mission and I could not let them suffer the way that I did. Um, I know what it feels like. Can you tell us a little more about that? Like growing up, like when did it start for you? What was it? How did it feel like? So I'm going to go back because I came from a very dysfunctional family. So I always thought that that's kind of why I was shy and why I was withdrawn and um, had low self-confidence and scared to talk to people and take risks until I read 
um, about selective mutism, and I think I had a double dose. So I had all the odds working against me. I didn't have this safe, supportive environment that my girls had that they could thrive through it. Um, so I had the dysfunctional family and the selective mutism and the social anxiety all odds working against me. So I couldn't make friends as a kid. I had low confidence. Um, my mom basically had to make friends for me. I couldn't raise my hand in class. Even if I knew the answer was 100% correct, I could not participate in class. And high school or middle school was the worst for me. Um, and if you can imagine, lunch periods, because it's unstructured, was total chaos to me. And if I didn't have familiar friends in my lunch, I would just kind of walk around and wander. And I'm going to date myself right now because back then there was pay phones. <laughs> we didn't have cell phones. So if I didn't have somewhere to sit, I would call my mom at work on the pay phone so I had a place to be just because I wanted to look busy and have a place to be. And now kids have their phone so they can look busy and seem distracted. Mm -hmm. But back then we didn't have that. So that's a that's an amazing story. So so it sounds like you were more motivated to help your daughters. So you didn't maybe even notice that issue in yourself until maybe you even had your daughters and you saw how they struggle, you understood their pain, and only through helping them, then you looked back at yourself and said, okay, now it's my turn. I, I have to work for this. Yeah, I I knew that I struggled socially. I didn't understand fully why. I thought it was just because I came from this dysfunctional family and I did have some child abuse uh, growing up through my teen years. So I always thought that that's why. Um, but now I think looking back when I was, you know, when my daughters got diagnosed, I'm like, that's also me as a kid. So I think I had that working against me as well as the abuse, which was a dumb, you know. So what did they get diagnosed with? My oldest, social anxiety and selective mutism. My youngest was more severe. She was a diagnosed with social anxiety, social phobia, selective mutism. She's got ADHD, misophonia, and had intense, severe separation anxiety. How is she doing now? Amazing. Yay. <laughs> How Amazing. old is she? She is now 13 in seventh grade. I had to think mm -hmm. for a minute. And she, she's doing, so how would you, like, tell us about her progression? Uh, so for preschool, there was no verbal communication. She would maybe, towards the end of preschool, mouth words or whisper. And even before that, she wouldn't participate in, you know, art. Kids love to do art. She kind of just stood there frozen. Uh, extreme separation anxiety, wouldn't eat snack, just completely, you know, frozen. And we did years of therapy, and many therapists, psychologists, social workers are not trained in this. Absolutely. And so I had to really do my research, and I found a conference that I attended and went to and bought every single book and started doing... I sent both my daughters to an intensive camp in Michigan, which does nothing but brave exposure practice, but in a school-like setting where that's all they work on. So my youngest went three years in a row, and my oldest, I believe, went one year and then was able to be a mentor for other kids um, that have overcome this. I mean, the mentor, the kid, men teen mentors were all students who have been through the program who have overcome it. So from there, I really just took it seriously, and we were always doing brave practice <laughs> everywhere we went. And I have to so. go back just a little bit because it sounds like you're you're downing 
therapist what's going on you're, you're kind of <laughs> no, like you're I like am not they went through downing. years and years no and, i am not but it's okay therapist. if you are I'm, I'm saying it's okay if you are i want you know i would love to learn from someone's perspective what is it that we do well and what is it that we don't do so well i just think that selective mutism is not there's not much awareness and i think that's the issue so for instance with my oldest I knew something was wrong. I could tell something was wrong. The pediatrician sent us to a social worker at uh, Children's. And, you know, she said, there's nothing wrong. She talks to me. <laughs> she, she, she'll she talk to the person in the office. But it manifests differently in every kid. And maybe one-on-one, -on -one, a kid is okay. And then in a group environment, they're not. So what I mean by that is we spent probably three years of therapy, not getting anywhere, not really getting that full diagnosis. What happened then was I couldn't attend uh, a school assembly that my oldest daughter was singing in or doing some kind of performance in. And so my husband attended and she was frozen, wouldn't even look at him, smile at him, talk to him. So you were their safe person, but without you, they wouldn't function. They wouldn't do that with me anyways mm -hmm. in a social setting. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. But she, she, he was there, and I couldn't be there, and he said, something is off. So at that point, I'm like, okay, let's call a, a psychologist, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, someone higher up to mm -hmm. get see if something's different. Then she got the diagnosis for selective mutism, social anxiety, mm -hmm. And, and psychologists are the experts in various diagnoses. They have a lot of testing. So a lot of patients think that therapists, social worker, counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist, nurse practitioner in psychiatry, that all of those uh, jobs are the same. But truly, psychologist is always your best person to go to if you want to get a diagnosis. If you want to figure out what is it that I'm suffering from, what is it that I have, they have a lot of testing that they will do. Yes, so they won't absolutely. really do a lot of times they don't do therapy in the traditional setting, but more or less they do a lot of testing. And some of them will also do therapy, but yes. a lot of them will just focus on testing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we did therapy with her and she was great and she was very supportive, but I was also paying two therapists at once mm -hmm. for two kids. <laughs> so I was paying the psychologist here to do in-person sessions. I was paying the psychologist that specializes in selective mutism, social anxiety, in another state to guide me through the process. So it was almost as if I was paying the psychologist here to train her on everything I learned from this specialist. So it was a lot. <laughs> and that's where I gained so much of my knowledge. And I'm thankful for the psychologist here. She was very supportive for the time being. She just, you don't know what you don't know. Absolutely. You mentioned brave, what did you call it? Brave exposure brave practice. Exposure. Could you talk about yes. that a little bit? So that is the most important thing for kids with social anxiety and selective mutism. And what that is, is practicing what we fear mm -hmm. in the area that it manifests, in the situation that it manifests, in the new environment mm -hmm. as it manifests, and it's baby steps. Okay. Baby steps and then increasing, increasing, but the key is consistency. If it's not, then you won't get those results. And how did you find them? How did I find what? The brave uh, exposure therapy through, you said, outside of the state, somewhere else. It was a camp. Um, that that was, was an intensive camp. And then I really just religiously did my own work with them when the camp was over. What that means is training the school staff, training the teachers, communication between the teachers. What is she doing at recess? What are you doing to engage her? you know, keeping progress. Did the teachers love you or hate you? <laughs> I would say a little both, <laughs> a little bit of both. Um, but at that point, you have to advocate for your kid. And that is something I feel really strong about is 
we must advocate for our kids and their needs. Mm -hmm. So all of those beautiful stories bring us to your business. Yes. So tell us about your business. So after they were thriving and on the other side of selective mutism and social anxiety, I knew I needed to do some work myself. When it really showed up was when my oldest daughter turned 13 and it was time to do a bat mitzvah speech for my daughter. <laughs> and so here I am with social anxiety, fear of speaking, let alone fear of public speaking. And at the place we did it at was a temple that was Orthodox. So for those of you that don't know, what that means is on Friday and Saturday, there's you use it's Shabbos. So you use no electronics or anything like that. So that means in this big giant temple in front of hundreds of people, I get to really project my voice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was no hiding. And I could not take that opportunity to not honor my daughter. I remember breaking out in hives. I remember my legs trembling and shaking, sweating. But honoring her and setting and also setting an example for her, you know, to see their mom push through it and to see their mom stand up there powerfully and speak. And uh, did you do it? I did it and Woo! I rocked it. Yeah. And that's where it all started. And then now I really think that we are best equipped in life to serve the person that we once were. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that statement. So what I mean by that is public speaking was my hugest fear, which is the number one fear in the world, by the way. <laughs> Huge fear. And social anxiety is something I struggled with. My for I'm 40, I'm going to be 46. Well, so... She doesn't she look gorgeous. <laughs> so for 42 years of my life I've struggled with it. And so now I really got the grasp on it and I want to give people that freedom of their voice. Let them know that it can be overcome social social anxiety and selective mutism and so that they can create that life that their heart longs for, create those relationships the jobs that they want, take risks, anything. So now you can help people do that. I do help people do that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us uh, what kind of clients should look for you. What kind of clients would get the most benefit from your work? Well, any kind of client that wants to create something that their heart longs for, that they don't currently already have, those are my clients. My specialty, what's closest to my heart, is social anxiety, selective mutism, facing fear, self-confidence, self-worth, public speaking. So... I need to come to you then. Yes. <laughs> That's beautiful. And... And you are a life coach. Can you tell us what a life coach is and what how they differ from traditional therapists, social workers, psychologists, people like that? So a therapist. Be nice. Come I'm on. I'm going to be nice. I went, hey, I went to many years of therapy my whole life off and on. So a therapist, the main difference between therapy and coaching is a therapist cradles the past. Mm. They go to the past and they cradle and rock the past. Whereas a coach is like, okay, cool. These things happen to you. Do you want to live the rest of your life there? Or do you want to propel forward? And so a coach is going to dig up to the roots, spend a little time there, and then say, how are we going to get you to where you want to be? And how, let's focus on that. So that's the main difference. As a coach focuses on the future, a therapist cradles the past. Mm. 
Beautiful. Wow. Do you, so how did you get to be a life coach? Um, I went to years of, you know, I did years of self-growth work and transformation on myself. And then I really fell in love with the work. I adore the work. I believe in the work. I've attended years of therapy and got nowhere. And here I did a couple years of deep transformational work and it's turned my whole life around. Are there certifications or like uh, structured some type of classes or universities or what kind of training in addition to experience? So for a life coach, you don't have to be certified. Technically, I wanted to be. I wanted to be credentialed and certified. And so I did the program. And then after you do the program, you do some mentor hours with a mentor. And then after that, you have to have so many coaching hours. Kind of like practicum or clinicals. So. Yeah, you have mm -hmm. to have so many coaching hours. Mm -hmm. And then you submit a video, a coaching session to be evaluated and... Then after that, if they approve your video, then you take a 300 question test that's timed. <laughs> nice. So that's how you get certified. And there's different levels. So I'm on the lowest one and I'm working to get a higher one too. Mm -hmm. I love that. What kind of uh, favorite client stories do you have? Maybe you can tell us about someone that improved or you had extreme you know, success with. Yeah, I... I adore all of my clients. Uh, I don't know how I got so <laughs> blessed and lucky. They are all so cool, so unique. And I feel blessed, honestly, to work with them. I have clients in Australia, Malta, New York, uh, all over. And what I've noticed is that all of my clients are creative, unique, um, super smart, and outgoing when they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's another key distinction of selective mutism and is when, you know, someone is shy, they're kind of shy across all settings. That's just their the way they're wired. That's their way of being. That's their nature. Whereas someone with selective mutism, it's almost like two personalities. So when they're comfortable, they're crazy, bossy, outgoing, off the walls, talkative. And then when they're uncomfortable, they shut down. So that's a key distinction between selective mutism and shyness. Hmm. I'm learning a lot and I'm feeling like I relate <laughs> to a lot of what you're saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. You so Oh, oh, go ahead. Okay. You mentioned self-confidence work. As, yes. So I'm so curious. Could you talk a bit more about that? And without giving away all your tips and yeah. tricks, what does a session on self-confidence kind of look like? Well, there's no session mm -hmm. on self-confidence. Right. I mean, each session is individualized to the client. But I guess the main distinction between, you know, there's many phenomenal psychologists that do this work and that are specialists in selective mutism and all these communication, social skills. But what I do is I, I intertwine what I've learned for selective mutism and social anxiety with the work of transformation, mm -hmm. with self-love, with self-worth, with self-confidence, with, you know, empowering yourself because all of that matters you can want speech you can want someone to be you know more outgoing but if you don't have if you're not backed with those tools as well then the results are not going to be so deep they're not going to be transformational that's results that really stick do you suggest people do a lot of um work with the past before coming to you or do you think anyone can kind of if they're anyone. ready yeah Anyone, unless they need a psychologist right. and are struggling with, you know, many mental disorders, then I am not that person that can treat, but I am that person that can guide you and coach you through getting through to the other side. 
Awesome. Okay. So tell us a success story of a client. <laughs> tell I us have many. something. I have you so have so many. many. Pick one. What about an artist? An artist? You know, they're all artists. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's so, it's, I don't know why it ended up. Can I just quickly give a little brief on a couple? Yes. Sure. Okay. So one, well, actually, I'm two. We're very similar. I have two that are very similar, similar in age as well. And they both were not ordering food out and about, not speaking to anyone out and about. Uh, they are both thriving now. They are both ordering, making friends, participating. I give them homework. They're completing their brave tasks. They're winning you know, a reward for that, and they're happier. Another one is there was a teen I worked with as well, and this person was an identical twin, and he would often speak in sounds sometimes, um, like, mm, mm, and we turned that around and we got wonderful communication going. He got confidence to get his driver's permit and to practice driving and to practice using his brave voice out in the community when ordering food, when out and about. So there's that success story and more confidence in the classroom and dealing with anxiety when it shows up. and learning how to navigate it instead of letting it control you. So he really gained those tools. And another one is a beautiful, gorgeous adult that I'm working with who didn't believe that you can push through mm -hmm. self-confidence and didn't believe that there was a purpose and a life for her and it's uh just thought that she's this way and that's the way it is and she reached out to me actually and we had a conversation call you know a con free connection call and i just something in her just really connected me to her i saw a piece of me in her and she ended up not signing up with me. And I couldn't stop thinking of her, so I reached out, which is not something I normally do. I took this risk because it mattered to me. And I ended up working with her a couple months later. And she wanted to see my reviews. She wanted to mm -hmm. overanalyze my websites, all these things. And I couldn't be more proud of her and all her progress she's made, um, taking risks, pushing herself, communicating with people at lunch. And she's just starting. She has so much more to go. Um, but really finding her joy, you know, finding things that she loves to do and that she can do and that our past does not define us, our diagnosis does not define us. Anything can be overcome if we work through it and it takes work. It's not easy. It takes work. And so you said that you have clients in Australia, and yes. New York, yes. and uh, some other places. So um, can do clients meet with you face-to-face? -face? Do you fly some places? Do they fly to you? Do you see them virtually? Um, so all of the above. <laughs> Most sessions I do right now are virtual, Zoom, face-to-face. -face. However, they are very interactive. It's not just... They're very interactive. So you mean I, on. I wouldn't be able to like fall asleep with a client. No. It's not like that. No. Like, this is what I do typically. <laughs> no, I we, just like. No, and we I play sleep. games. No, we you, do okay. art. We dance. Oh. We get up out of our chairs and move around. Wow. 
I give them homework. Um, so yeah, Zoom sessions, they're face-to-face. -face. I have flown and traveled and done this work inside of schools, training teachers and staff how to get speech and transferring speech to them and so that they have the tools to then expand a student's circle and their friends and to really understand the importance of consistency and the importance of brave exposure practice. I cannot stress that enough. And so uh, there's been that as well. And I'm getting ready to launch a training. Ooh, nice. <laughs> so, yes, uh, which will be first focused on teens and that will cover self-confidence, self-love, authenticity, embracing your gifts, learning how to navigate your struggles, learning how to own your voice, share your opinions, speak your truth. Sounds and like we all need it. Yeah. yeah. And this training, this is for the average person or is this for other life coaches to kind of adapt some of your methods? No, this one is going to be for the average person. Okay. But I, the first one I'm going to do is teens. Okay. And then I will expand it to adults as well. Okay, I will be waiting. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. Oh, it's going it. to be fun. I, I'm very excited about it too. I love hearing about your methods, the dancing, the interactive. Because, you know, whenever I – I've, I've been in therapy for a while and I'm doing like somatic experiencing and trying all these things. And usually it's just like, you know, we're sitting there and I'm in place and I'm just like fidgeting. So it just sounds so interesting to really be active. And you also sound like you, you just care about your, your clients so much. And I just, I yeah. love hearing that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, when we're dancing and moving our bodies, a lot of the time it's to get out of our head. Yeah. And to really get into our bodies and our heart, because when we're stuck in our head, we're overthinking, we're overanalyzing, we're holding back, we're wondering what's next, wondering if I'm going to make a mistake. So it's really to get them comfortable in their body, to relax, loosen up, and get out of your our heads. I love that. I wish I had you when I was a teenager. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So for the for the listeners that want to become maybe more self-confident, maybe use their voice more, maybe speak up more, right? And so many people struggle with this. Um, would you say there are books or shows or podcasts or YouTube videos or something maybe that help helped you as a life coach, but then also helped your clients? I mean, or maybe you're producing some of these um, shows or, or po podcasts? Or yeah, I, I mean, there's so many podcasts to listen to and so many. I am a fan of audiobooks. I'm not a huge reader, <laughs> but I love audiobooks. And so what I'll do is when I'm at the gym, I'm listening to an audiobook. And sometimes I'm listening to the same audiobook two and three times in a row to take it onto a deeper meaning, to absorb it even more. And we can always learn and grow. The, the, the process of learning and growing is lifelong. It never stops. Never. Any favorite? I love Mel Robbins. I love the high five habits. I love the five second rule. I love oh, that one is about when the food falls to the floor. <laughs> no, I can pick it up. no <laughs> girl. I do it all the time. <laughs> that one's like when you giving yourself five seconds to step into action. So anything we resist, five, four, three, two, one, step into action. Ooh. Because when we delay it, then a lot of times we don't do it. Could this apply to like doing the dishes and I'm just I'm everything. 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 So I'm looking at the dishes, I'm on the couch and I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna do that. Do I just go five, four, three, two, one and stand up and just yep. push through it? Absolutely. Or, or as an alternative, yeah. you could just keep waiting until somebody else steps into that same role and steps and step in and do it, right? You could like wait around no. and like no. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I feel like I, I definitely have like a brick wall. Because I'm diagnosed with ADHD. So there's like yeah. I think some people call it the brick wall where it feels like literally I can't do it so i feel like i'm gonna try that i'm gonna just try counting and pushing and see yeah maybe saying it out loud and like you know 
I'm going to check out that book. <laughs> it's a great book. There's so many. There's Brene Brown. There's mm -hmm. Man's Search for Meaning, which is a powerful book about a survivor living through the Holocaust and shifting their mindset wow. when everything seems to be going wrong. There's so many out there. And... There's a really good book that's super simple. Mm -hmm. It's called Who Moved My Cheese. It's really cute. Um, just about, you know, how life changes and how we have to always, it's not always going to be cookie cutter how we want it to be, but it, we get to shift and flow and be flexible along with it. Love that. Thank you. <laughs> Would you have any tips for parents who perhaps have children or teenagers that that experience extreme anxiety and maybe sometimes parents think like, oh, they're faking it or they're just mm -hmm. making it up. You know, do you have any tips for parents that are watching their kids, maybe not fully participating in life, withdraw, isolate? Yeah. My number one tip is this. Very often anxiety is genetic. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's not the same form of anxiety. Maybe it's general anxiety and your daughter or your son has social anxiety. They are all intertwined. So if you have any anxiety yourself to heal yourself and to do the work yourself, you can. we cannot, as a parent, ask our kids to do something that we are not willing to do ourselves. And anxiety is an energy. Everything is an energy. Happiness is an energy. Anger is an energy. Sadness is an energy. So if they feel our anxiety, they're feeding off of it. True. It's so powerful to think of about our parents and the things we might have. Like, of course, we dive into our past. It always comes up. But right. um, do you ever have to... I'm assuming if you work with kids, you also have to speak to their parents. And what's oh, kind of that of dynamic like? It's wonderful. Yeah. All yeah. the parents that I've worked with, I've been blessed, have really been hands-on. They are so committed, and they want their teens or kids or whatever to have the results. And I am also very committed. Yeah. <laughs> I care about the results, their results are my results. They are a reflection of me. Wait a minute. <laughs> Sounds a little different than like with insurance companies. <laughs> you know, we social workers, we got to focus on what the problem is and then bill with a code of what the problem is and then justify that what we're doing fits the diagnosis. So actually, we don't bill for results. We just bill for the time. Yeah. So you're saying you're all about the results. It's like a different mindset. You know, it's like Absolutely. a different mindset. Well, the thing is, is I would never take on a client, even if they thought that I was the perfect person for them, but in my heart, I knew I wasn't. I wouldn't take them on because the results and their growth is too important to me. I care too much. So just like I have to be a good fit for them, they also need to be a good fit for me. That's Avery Sunshine. Yay. I know. Hey, dear <laughs> Sunshine. I love it. Yes. Do you have any other favorite client stories with a huge success at the end? They've all had success, and they're all still going. There is no end. Like, the work continues. It will always continue. But what about my favorite story? about one of your clients. Oh, that's just, that was very recent. So I was working with this cute, adorable little rock star girl. I call all my clients rock stars, by the way. <laughs> they are all rock stars. And uh, we got so many results through Zoom. And we really wanted to go into the school and get those results there. And so... I flew out there for two days, and I went into the school with her for two full days, and we expanded the circle. She talked, we got communication going to about 13 new staff members, teachers, staff, officers, school nurse, music teacher, this, that, the other. 
every single girl in our class got communication going with. And we did one male student at that time. And there were times where we were fighting, pushing through tears and facing fear. And we pushed through the tears and we kept going. And then there were times where I knew we needed a break. And so we shook it off, took a break around the school, walked around How the school. Is the, girl, the rock star girl? She will be nine very soon. Mm -hmm. um, and when doing this kind of work, what needs to happen first is there has to be a strong, solid foundation. So the relationship between her and I has got to be strong. She's got to trust me. It's got to, I, you know, she's got to know that we are team, that she's not in there doing this work alone, that we're doing it together, and that I believe in her because I do. And so it's really having that foundation of a strong, solid relationship in order to take those risks, to face the fear, and to face, because it's, it, we literally, she faced fear two days nonstop, <laughs> all day long. That's all we did. And how, what was the reaction of the school? And they were giving me fist bumps. They said, you're magical. They were proud of me. They surprised me with donuts, a pink one with rainbow sprinkles on Amazing. it. Which matches uh, your personality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was so beautiful. Such an amazing experience. And I'm grateful for them because without them, I could not get these results. The fact that they wanted to learn, that they cared, that they allowed me and trusted me was how we got that result. I will stress that this is a team effort. This is not something one parent can do alone, one social worker can do alone, one teacher, one coach, one nothing. Navigating selective mutism, social anxiety, is a team effort. Everyone has to be on the same page. Takes a village. Yeah. Yes. Do you have any challenges that come up with your work? Not really. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Not what really. about social media? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, I've had some pushback with social media of... I'm not a psychologist. Right. I do not diagnose. So I will say I do not diagnose or treat. However, I am a phenomenal coach for coaching parents, teens, and adults through selective mutism, social anxiety, self-love, self-worth, self-confidence, taking risk, public speaking, owning their voice, all of that. And my strength is brave exposure practice. I've definitely seen, um, you know, on TikTok and stuff, people pushing back on life coaches. But I think it's very different when you're credentialed like you are. You, you know, you went through a pretty intense. What did you see on TikTok? Who is pushing on what? What's what going back on? <laughs> life coaching. People, I, I you missed know, out on TikTok. So. People just want to <laughs> say something and, mm -hmm. you know. But um, everybody's always, you know, trying to make somebody else feel, feel bad. bad. But the truth is, if you really care about something and you love your your clients and you care about them mm -hmm. and you believe in them, I think that's what the healing is. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. it, it, people are going to talk no matter what. Right. When, no matter what you do, somebody has something to say, to like, to dislike. It's going to happen. And there are so, therapists that aren't, you know. So <laughs> at the end of the day, it's your results that really speak and like your there care. There are therapists that fall asleep during sessions. No way. <laughs> no way. It did happen to me once. You fell asleep? Yeah. yeah. Wow. I was very tired. <laughs> I still was pushing through it. And the client was an adult and had a very, very monotone voice. Mm. And I didn't like snore or anything, but I was experiencing like my eyes would just like literally like when he was talking, just close. Mm. And I had a harder and harder time. And I would catch myself and like, it was a mess. I had to go to the bathroom and like throw cold water on my face to wake myself up. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I was like, can you please excuse me? 
Yeah. Sounds like you guys need to dance and move around That's first. what I mean. Yes. <laughs> Maybe I do need to incorporate that sometimes. What about your social media presence? I'd, lo- I'd love to talk more about that and yeah. what it looks like where you're at. Facebook. I have a group. It's called Sunshine Mindset. And it's really focused on selective mutism, social anxiety. And for anyone that struggles with owning their voice or sharing their opinions or their truth. and Or naked truth. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what that group focuses on. And I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on TikTok. And I am on Instagram. Okay. All under Sunshine Mindset. The one on LinkedIn is also – it's under my name, I believe, Avery Sunshine, but you'll see Sunshine Mindset. Perfect. Yeah. We will include that in the description. (laughs) Would you like to share any other wisdom with our listeners? Anything else that that you found through years and years of studying selective mutism, anxiety? I mean, this goes for anyone, is that the only way to the other side of fear or what we resist is to go through it. There's no other way to get to the other side other than to go through it. I think it's great that, you know, people who need to go through it don't have to do it alone because it sometimes it seems too much yeah, to kind of do it. Yeah, and that's – I have a coach. <laughs> yeah. So I, I believe in coaching. Um, it's not just something I do. I have one myself. And, you know, we are team. And even though we're not talking every day, I feel that sense of team. Mm. And so that's also what my clients get. They have their personal, I, I tell them they have their personal orange haired cheerleader. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're all my rock stars, and they are rock stars. And I think in this society, there's this pressure, you know, to do it alone, individualism, like, I don't need anyone else, and I'm going to figure it out. And I just love that you're highlighting, you know, we have a team. We work together. As humans, we're, we evolve to work yeah. together. Yeah, and um, that's what I stress on my Facebook page is that let's build community. Let's build connection. Yeah. We're yeah. stronger together. Right. We are. There is room for every single person in this world to shine their light. And we all have those gifts and talents and those tools for self-confidence, self-love, self-worth, to own our voice. They're already inside of us. Mm -hmm. It's just finding them, practicing them, and owning them Mm -hmm. is the only difference. And also giving ourselves permission. Yes, absolutely. That's a big one. Because I know a lot of people, especially creatives, think, you know, oh, that's already created. You know, why would I want to – the industry is so saturated. It's like – Everyone has their own individual, Mm -hmm. they're their own individual person. The art that you create will never be the same as anyone else. Yeah, and the way that you even say the same exact message could resonate with someone else Right. that the other speaker or the other person or the other therapist didn't resonate with. So everyone is different. Yeah. And there's there's just an, a different energy with everyone too, you know. Sometimes people will pick up on it or they won't, you know. Um I guess that's why shop, like I've had like different <laughs> therapists, but yeah. You know, when you just find one that works, they just get you. There's almost yes. like a like a a nonverbal understanding as well. So yeah. and I I bet it's the same with coaches too. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I agree. Yeah. Avery, mm-hmm. you have been Fabulous. You're a sunshine. <laughs> and immediately as you entered the room, there was there was energy shift, right? I know. So we we loved having you here. Thank we will you. we will share information with everyone that listens and we hope folks sign up with you because it sounds like you're doing an amazing work. Yes. And we Thank like you for the, having me. Of mm-hmm. course. And at the end, we like to do a naked truth. So each person will say something that resonates with them, either from this interview or just in general. It could be a quote. It could be completely unrelated. I will start. Sure. Yeah. I really uh, liked how you said that there is always, that we're always growing and learning. Yeah. And that it never stops. Yeah. Because it never does. We are always going to keep growing, always learning. And sometimes people think that 
that they need something extreme to teach them something, that they need that life-changing experience. Or, But the truth is we're always growing. Even right now, we, we may not realize it, but even right now we're growing. And change usually is slow and progressive. And as long as you have that desire to change, grow, then you're doing it right now. You're like a tree yes. that's growing by little tiny the re- bits and the pieces. The roots are deep. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. And this was so deep, right? I love <laughs> it. That's my truth for today. You said so many um, just, um, what's the word? Just powerful things today that oh. I really took a pause and I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, my naked truth. I didn't think about this one. Do you want to go first? <laughs> I really have not thought of. I don't even know what a naked truth is. Like, what am it's I? It's usually anything. you have to undress and no, sit oh, naked. No, I'm not doing that. Then I'm going to own us. my voice and say no. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, it's anything that you would like to share, but you've shared so much today. So, anything that you would like to share? A quote, something that means a lot to you, something you live by. I guess the main thing would be that if there is something in our life that we don't currently already have that we want to have, whether it's self-confidence, self-love, more money, whatever it is, better relationships, something inside of us needs to change, whether it's our habits, whether it's our practices, whether it's our mindset, whether it's the way we talk to ourselves, our limiting beliefs. If there's something in our life that we don't currently already have, something inside of us needs to change. I love that. Mm -hmm. Now I have to follow with my basic naked truth. Um, (laughs) My naked truth is um, that there's space for everyone. And yes. all of our voices are meaningful and important in the world. Yeah. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Woo.